um, yeah, small note is that uh, Open BTS has two modes, so we call it open registration and closed registration. Uh, the difference is that uh, when you try to connect the network, Open BTS uh, may accept may, may accept you without checking the database, or it could check database whether uh, your your SIM card is provisioned into it. And uh, so the difference between those modes is that uh, when it doesn't check, it actually allows everyone to connect. And uh, this is well, useful when you are try trying to run your base station in some area where there is no coverage and you want uh, to give, give people access to your network. I think that's what they, that you are using in uh, Burning Man. Yeah, open registration is convenient because it allows an unprovisioned handset to attach to the network. But now, once the handset is attached to the network, you can use things like SMS and IVRs to provision a handset over the network. So it's really handy. Yeah, but uh, in situations like here, where you have coverage and uh, where you have people uh, who expect a certain level of clear grade. Uh, performance and ability to call uh, outside and be reachable from outside. This is a very bad idea to turn open registration on because it means that uh, you will suck all the roaming uh, phones into your network. And uh, as as long as it is independent from from the rest of the world, they will be uh, efficiently cut off from their yeah. normal communication. If you're not careful with open registration, you can easily run it. You can easily accidentally run it. Yeah, so, so, so uh, be careful. If you are turning on your BTS, even for power, in the public space, uh, make sure you do not run open registration mode. Otherwise, you may actually run a DOS on people connections. Is there a risk that the uh, commercial operators detect you if you have a test network at home? I mean, because if you have your, your phone that registered to the network, will it announce after that it has moved to this network in the commercial? It's unlikely. It's, it's, I mean, there, there's a signature that's left behind in the network that that happens. It's extremely unlikely anybody's going to notice. Mm. Yes. So there is no, there is actually no risk that the commercial yeah. operator so sees that in this location the phone went out of the network and came back and. Yeah, this happens very, very often, you know. Yeah. Okay. Getting called. I mean, your, your phone, your phone, will, your phone will go out of the network and go back to the carrier's network, carrying the MCC and IMEI that you were using on yeah. the test network. So they'll see something funny happen. But unless you're doing that to thousands of phones at a time, no one's going to notice. Okay. If they do it to thousands of phones at a time, they will notice. At Burning Man, we actually got a call from the network <laughs> operations center of a local cellular carrier asking us um, about some strange activity they were seeing. Well, and are you allowed to do that? I mean, when you have a test license? Uh, we, we, made some you... we, made some, we made some technical accommodations to, to make their lives easier. Nothing legally. We weren't disrupting service, so we didn't have to. We're just trying to be But normally, a phone, if it, if it gets the uh, reception from the official networks, has no reason to switch to this test network. That's correct. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah, well, that's that reason. We have to be considerably more powerful. But, I mean, the phones are supposed to refer to for operators. So, in this particular case, we were on a test network at Burning Man, so the coverage from the commercial operator was very spotty. Mm -hmm. um, so things were going back and forth. We were trading thousands of handsets every hour with the commercial operator, and they, they knew it, and they knew we were out there because you know, they saw our license. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that uh, in order for the, for the phone to authenticate uh, the network, uh, the knowledge of the key I, key, secret key, is uh, uh, mandatory. So I guess we cannot use our uh, regular SIM card from our commercial operator okay. to, to run that. What's about the SIM card? Good, good, good question. Uh, 
Yes, so regarding their closed registration mode and authentication. Uh, so the thing is that uh, by default, OpenBTS does not try to really authenticate you. It just identify you by your IMC. So your IMC is uh, written into a SIM card <coughs> is uh, available to the network at any time, to any network. And by default, uh, their OpenBTS just requests IMSI uh, from the phone, it gets IMSI and tries to find it in the private registry. So no authentication. But when uh, authentication uh, happens, uh, you need to know this KI to perform authentication and then encryption. And this KI is uh, written to the SIM card, but it is not available for reading. Uh, it's uh, like an, any smart card, uh, I think. It's, uh, you could uh, run a, their authentication algorithm on a SIM card, on a SIM card uh, given a nonce, and then uh, get the result of this algorithm out of the card. But you cannot read KI. So uh, there are only two, there's only one party uh, which knows KI. It's, it is your original mobile operator. And so there is no like easy way to uh, get this KI out of a SIM card. There was one for older ones, but not for the recent ones. Uh, and this means that uh, if you have a SIM card, uh, just, just a random SIM card from an existing operator, uh, you cannot authenticate because you, the operator of OpenBTS, do not know the KI. And this is why here uh, on the Congress, uh, we uh, distribute uh, special SIM cards for which TI is known by us. So we could really authenticate uh, the access to the network. And if you want to deploy your, your network in a, like close to real or in, in real installations, you have to have your own SIM cards, uh, either programmable SIM cards if you want just like a thousand, uh, or you could buy uh, pre-programmed SIM cards from, for example, Chinese manufacturers if you want like 100,000 uh, SIM cards. This is not that hard to do there. Chinese yes. guys are happy to, buy, to, to sell you 100,000 SIM cards. Yes. Sir, I as far as I can remember, in 26 in Berlin, there was an option just to select a network from the list and authenticate to it without changing the SIM Yeah. It was something different than there, or, or yeah, you it, had a special license? Or, or it, was, uh, it was exactly open registration. Ah. And the problem is that uh, if, uh, your, if your operator has coverage here, your, your, your phone would not connect to this network and you would have, have to uh, set it manually. But if your, if your phone operator do not have coverage, your phone will try to connect to the network automatically. And uh, people and person may not notice that uh, the phone changed the network from the real operator's network to a test network. And in this case, uh, the phone will say, okay, like full bars, everything is fine, but you, it, you won't be, you won't won't be reachable I just uh, from outside. Know, I just don't know if it's the list of the available GSM network has there any preference field or something like yes. this. Yes. So the SIM so card... you can set the lowest reference to this network. No, that's, no? Uh, no, that's not possible. So there is a preference list on the SIM card. Uh, SIM card has, has a so-called blacklist okay. and preferred list. Uh, in blacklist, uh, operators uh, like list each other if they do not want you to roam. Like for example, in Russia, uh, big three operators uh, do not allow you to roam into the other operator network. So called like, national roaming is not available. Um, and then they just like list each other. And uh, if you uh, if you do manual search, you will see that uh, like red uh, red cross near the separator saying that you can't connect to this network. Uh, and also there is a preferred list. Uh, on older phones, like uh, Siemens phones, uh, you was able, you were able to actually edit this list manually. On Android phones, I think it's not available, but there are may maybe there are some 
applications, I don't know. But it, it, it was available uh, on older phones, and you could see this preferred list. It's just a list of uh, MCC and MMC um, in the order of preference. Like the most preferred roaming, uh, roaming partners are first, so that's the least uh, preferred roaming partners are the last. But you cannot, uh, as long as you cannot like, access uh, user SIM cards, you cannot put your network in blacklist. That's the problem. But, I mean, yes. uh, so meaning that in, in the GSM environment so with the IMS systems, they have some roaming protocol which forwards the authentication uh, to the home register, the home thing register, or, mm -hmm. or the other guys. Okay. So in theory, we could do something else. If we have a couple of uh, systems set up in different countries. We could uh, build a roaming service where um, uh, openly. BTS could theoretically roam with each other. If yeah. Okay. Exactly. Is that already a project? Uh, not yet, but well, that's very, very neat thing. Uh, yes. That, that was the reason when I asked for a community ah. to test. Yeah. yeah. So I planned to do it for the next year. All right. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> uh, I think in the current version of OpenBTS, the uh, A5 uh, encryption is not uh, supported uh, right now from the. Uh, it is it. not supported yet, but it will be supported soon. Uh, I, I'm gonna because we are trying to test it here, but something didn't didn't well didn't went very well. Uh, but it's close. I want to ask the uh, expected time. Any schedule? Close. <laughs> so, stay tuned. Real soon. Real soon. Yeah, it's good. From 15 minutes to say a couple of months. <laughs> uh, yeah. Also, I have a time for the uh, UMTRX hardware. Yeah, so uh, about the interest hardware, uh, we are accepting pre orders right now. Pre uh, orders are for uh, 1500 US dollars. So, this is about the price of user, but you get the hardware which is specifically designed to run the GSM and you don't have clock issues, for example. Um, and early next year we will start like production sales. Again, I can give you like estimate, but we have, like, early next year so <laughs> pre, -order, uh, pre orders for the first batch are already accepted, accept, and uh, I hope they will be shipped in January to the first customers. Yes. Now, what is the average distance uh, on the laboratory equipment? Is okay, that's a good question. Uh, so, uh, on a normal user or user without any, any anything, like power application, just uh, use, the, use the small antenna. Yeah, using small antenna, you would cover, well, again, it depends on, on walls and everything, but if you don't have walls, it's probably like two, three hundred meters. Uh, so, for example, right now, using this patient antennas, uh, we cover almost the whole floor with a single uterus. Well, the coverage is not very well at the edges, but the most of the floor is covered. So just to give you an idea of, okay. of coverage. Will the price of the hardware uh, change, will change in the future? I hope so. <laughs> uh, yes. The question regarding the received performance, um, did you compare your algorithms with any other industry standard receivers regarding performance of the receiver? Well, I do not something? have any, any other receiver. Yes. The GSM specification for base stations says that they should provide uh, service grade quality that is no higher than 3% frame error rate at, I believe, negative 108 dBm. Um, I know for the range stuff, we actually calibrate all of them. Anything that doesn't meet that spec is sent back. Most of the range stuff, um, it's, it's service grade around negative 110. Does it also support the same direction? Uh, cover is wrong. Not yet, no. Yeah, so we are working on implementing uh, a dual, dual, dual channel receive uh, for open BTS, but it's not there yet. Yeah. So the thermal noise for the GSM channel is negative 120 dBm. Um, it's a GMS phase signal. It doesn't take a whole lot of margin. So if you have a reasonable noise figure and some reasonable margin, a really good design can be out functional right somewhere in the neighborhood of negative 120 dBm. Okay. Thank you.
Uh, yeah, I want to ask, I remember there was another component that I didn't really fully understand. The, I think it was called no, no. JGLR, which was something implemented by CGI scripts, if I remember correctly. Um, so this is an update something. This is um, a script, I, I think it's a script which is used for provisioning. The a CGI script. Yeah, you, 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 stay, you stay on the website that it's or RLP or what? Or RLP? R R L P or what? Mm -hmm. There's something RLP is radio resource location protocol. That's the protocol for talking to GPS receivers and GPS capable handsets. Um, radio resource location protocol in order to really work for, for GPS requires aiding information be sent from the network home and accurate memories for GSM for GPS mean. It's handset based positioning based on GPS. Network assisted handset based positioning. So the RLP server is a server that provides any information for our GPS queries. Yeah, so, so network, network could ask for your location without you knowing that you're at that. They yeah. ask for location. Uh, and this is used for emergency calls. At least it was designed to be used for emergency calls, if I understand correctly. So yeah. when you call emergency, you do not need to describe, like, oh, I'm near some red tower, you know. The, your location is already known by operator and transferred to emergency center, so they know where exactly you are located and send, send, send you some yeah. Yeah, the GPS. The uh, GPS aiding server is written in Erlang, it's implemented as a CGI plugin in Apache. And do you always need a duplex or can you just operate on two antennas? Oh yeah, okay. So for for laboratory use you could avoid using two using a duplexer and just operate with two antennas. And this works reasonably well for laboratory um, laboratory equipment. I mean, cover like a couple of rooms like that is all the best one. Uh, I'd like to stress the um, hardware part. Um, if I'd like to start with OBDS right now for a lab or so, how much money I need to spend on hardware? Uh, so, approximately. Again, like about 1500 mm -hmm. thousand and a half dollars. That's like, well, you could, you could uh, start with a user B100. Uh, which is slightly less expensive. Uh, well, people people use it, but yeah, it has some drawbacks. Okay. Yeah. 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 So it may work for you. It may not work for you. It's, it's a much of luck in some at some point. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, do you plan on doing a UTS or FTE support? Yeah. And I uh, well, I mean, think Range is doing some UMTS stuff, but not openly. Yeah, Range. We're we're doing a UMTS stack. We're probably not going to release it publicly for a while. Yeah. Um, for FTE, there are a couple of open source projects. Yeah. So there are a couple of months open source projects as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're so probably going to do LTE. As soon as we're done with the UMTS, we're going to do LTE. Uh, the UMTS is a nightmare of, of horrific over engineering. Um, we expect to count out LTE in about six months. LTE is much nicer from, at least from a regular perspective, LTE is much nicer than the UMTS. Yeah, I was wondering if the modulation and the modulation quality is already available on a typical layer for UMTS and the uh, for LT, well, some parts are available open source. I'm not sure which parts are available. I have never looked at it. Mm -hmm. Nothing really working like, in production, to be honest. Yeah, for UMTS, mm -hmm. it's even worse. Yeah. 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 The UMTS radio mode is much more complicated than yeah. LT radio mode is basically the best way to transform. The best way to transform. But it's a, it's a massive work to develop this UMTS. So how do, what do you how do you benefit from doing this on open source? I mean also like is it open BTS? Did you benefit from doing it in open source with contributors or what? possibly companies helping? Open, open BTS. So yeah, open BTS. GSM or I mean the GSM part. Yeah. 
Um, by the time we released it, it was largely functional. Um, I mean, there's there are some this this there's a whole series of questions about how do you how do you use G, how do you use UPL licenses in commercial context? Yes. So uh, and the answer is very carefully. But um, we we have been we have benefits from from doing that, but they're not with so much direct benefits. We have a lot of indirect benefits, but not a lot of direct benefits. Mm -hmm. that's, that's true. I mean, I know Fairways does a lot of stuff adding to PTNs, but for licensing reasons, we don't use any of their code because we like to control our own licenses. <coughs> This is something you find in for funding. So you can, can get funded by uh, consulting or other things. Or uh, no, actually, our, our model right now is we had some we had some investors put in some seed money, and um, investors funded development, and we're you know we, we're a company. We sell we sell products. We're, we we sell products. People write us checks. Mm -hmm. That's our business model. Um, and is there, isn't there, is there a business model for commercial operators for ultra, ultra low cost uh, micro sales? Or in the long like run, that? in the long run, we want to be dealing with large commercial operators. In the near term, uh, we're dealing with a lot of what we call private industrial network operators, which are things like mining operations or offshore oil platforms. Mm. Um, we also deal with people who run remote facilities like the Antarctic Division, the Australian Antarctic Division's customer works. Um, and uh, about half of our business is um, government stuff. Mm -hmm. A lot of defense contractors buy our stuff, as you see, for example. So, if I fed up with uh, OpenBPS, uh, what, about, what should I come to about treatment giving? Can I use any band or uh, what about the licensing scenarios? Okay, let, let, let's. Let, have, so let, let me just jump to this part. Yeah. I think that's okay. the time. Yeah, we can jump to that part. I've actually logged on to a base station in my house right now. <laughs> the miracle of SSH. Um, but yeah, let's talk about that. I have just another small question about uh, the SSH. Um, I know it's because uh, UDP interface to actually send your own packets onto the network from um, layer clicks. Yeah. So basically, um, I can only send things that I don't need to receive any response for, right? Because it's. Yeah, it was kind of. That, that was never really complete. You're welcome to complete it. I, I give you a smart ass open source answer. You're welcome to complete it. <laughs> 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 All right. I think we actually rewired this code. It's available. Yeah, yeah. 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 What? We rewired this code. We rewired this code. We rewired this code. We rewired this code. 1.1 is specially assigned to the first update. Okay. No, no, no. 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 Um, a couple things about, first of all, how many people are from the United States? Right. Oh, okay. Um, I'll talk very briefly then about what I know best. You don't have to stop, David! David, stop doing this. No, no, no. You can change it. It's on camera. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have a question. Uh, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, a question. So, in, th in theory, um, we can set up s some kind of rogue uh, BTS to intercept some, well, to target some mobile station and to perform yeah. some kind of man in the middle, but uh, only in when the mobile station uh, uh, makes a call. The outside, but it, sure. it, it is not reachable from the outside, right? Okay, so here's here's my answer as, as an American citizen. Here's my answer. <laughs> Don't do it. If I go into a detailed explanation of that, describing that to you, I would be guilty of an ITAR violation, of an arms exporting violation. Oh. The second part, though, and this is the ironic part, the actual procedures for doing that were described in a patent. A patent published by the European Commission, but it gets better. <laughs> in 2007, that patent was invalidated on the grounds of obviousness. <laughs> so I can say it's obvious, but I can't tell you. <laughs> this is the absurdity. <laughs> 
Selection networks on the High Court of the UK. Look up selection. Look look up a case involving selection networks. C E L L X I O N selection networks. Um, it was like I said. It's the patent was invalidated around obvious So this is the process in the United States. Although I'm told that in Germany the process is not that different. Um, maybe a German has gone through the process has something to say about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, the FCC has an online an online database where you can um, you just fill out a form. Here's an example example of filing. You fill out a form online that looks something like this. Um, the real information they care about goes at the bottom of the second page. Uh, you submit this form online with a $60 credit card payment, and uh, a couple weeks later, you get your license. You need to get a license or you get an email from somebody at the MCC asking for additional technical information. Uh, questions? Could you scroll back up a bit just to get the title of the. Oh, the title of that report? Special temporary. Yeah, special temporary. The key okay, special, the, temporary. special temporary authority. If you're doing this on the FCC website, don't get stuck in the universal licensing system. What you want to go to is something called OET, the Office Office of Engineering and Technology. It's a different license application process. And if you go through universal licensing, you'll fill out the same form that a cell phone that a cellular carrier would have to figure out. And that's not what you want to do. You want to go to the Office of Engineering and Technology fill out the request for a special temporary authority. It's a much shorter form to process it fast. And basically, you know, their obligation, if they don't have a good reason not to give you that license, they're going to burn it. It's, it's, it's not a situation where you have to demand and justify the license. It's that if they're not going to give it to you, they have to give you a good reason not to. Do you need to have some sort of radio operator's license? No. 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 Amateur radio license? No, it's not amateur radio. There's no technical test associated with it. Now you are subject to criminal and pen, criminal and civil liabilities if you screw up, but they don't require a license. They do have, you know. But if you put your point, if, you, if you're the point of contact for the license, you you may be held criminally liable or something. Okay. You can get the same thing in Germany from the point of sale for, for temporary assignments. Yeah, it will cost you about two hundred euros. No. I've also done it in Finland, if anyone is interested, which was pretty much the same procedure. You ask them, they say why, you tell them, and they give you the license. Yeah. So it seems to vary a lot. Countries that, countries that really want to have a telecommunications, a native telecommunications industry, make this easy. Countries that don't want to have a native telecommunications industry don't know how to make this easy. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's about what it comes down to. One question. Um, in the US, there is an amateur radio band uh, within the range, is it possible to tune um, there? The, the short answer, the short answer is no. Running the GSM, uh, at least as, as far as I understand in American law, running the GSM signal under the amateur radio band is probably going to be a violation of your amateur license. But also because of duplexing, you've got to get the license for the other frequency too. Because of frequency duplexing, you really have to get two. You really need to license two frequencies. You have to license your downlink, but you also have yeah. to license your uplink. And that uplink isn't going to be in the amateur radio. Your downlink might be in the 900 megahertz. Um, and does the duplex, the duplex uh, space is always the same, or can it's it's 45 megahertz in the low bands. Yeah, that's too much. So, okay. Um, even then, running in the GSM 900 band, at least in, in North America, is a mess. Because in, in North America, that's an unlicensed ISM band also, and there's all kinds of junk. It's it's just a very cluttered and noisy band. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a few of the nine hundred megahertz. There's uh, a lot of uh, sensor networks, uh, uh, a lot of sensor network equipment, um, short range, yeah, uh, Wi-Fi things like that are starting to crop up in nine hundred megahertz. Yeah, yeah. There's just a lot of crap down there. It's, it's rapidly going away to one form. Yeah.
Um, other countries, quick notes on other countries, in the Netherlands and the UK, there are actually slices, small slices of GCS 1800 where you can operate unlicensed. Um, there's a notification requirement. There's, there's an equipment registration or notification requirement, but there's not a licensing requirement. Um, what's that? Sorry? Israel. Yeah, what about Israel? I haven't even looked at Israel. <laughs> I work with cellular networks in Israel. So okay. Not to get a license. So, I can read you the list. Yeah. Um, I didn't even look at the stuff for Israel because the key information was in Hebrew. So, yeah, I don't read Hebrew. You know, we could put a copy of this on. Um, we can just put a copy of this page on the um, public wiki somewhere. If you want to look at it. I'm not 100% sure, but if it's, there's some, some uh, spectrum reserved from the UK and the Netherlands that should probably be the same in all the assets of countries. You know? it, it is. The question is whether you're legally allowed to use it. Yeah, I, it, I seem to remember there's something in, in the German frequency usage plan where you're allowed to do it, but only you have to make absolutely sure that you have to stick within the boundaries of, of your um, your plant or basically your, your grounds. Um, and that, that's obviously very difficult. But for a test set up in a lab, that might might be easily achievable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, what this is, it's it's there's a guard band between I think the DCS eighteen hundred downlink band and deck. There's a slice, it's about five megahertz wide that was reserved as a guard band. And then later regulators figured out they didn't really need the guard band there. So they opened these frequencies up in all kinds of different ways. Depending on the country, it was regulated different ways. But this is a question also regarding the handset. Do, do some handset have the possibility to slightly tune out of bands or to be Not re really. reflashed or to, no, to use bands would be like this guard band? Or? No, because there's all sort of band, there's band specific filtering in front of the handset, and you're not going to re that's mm -hmm. a matter if you reprogram it, you just make it unusable. Mm -hmm. um, so. One more question on the data transfer. Is there any work happening on GPRS or the edge? Yeah, again, there, there are two GPRS implementations for OpenBTS. Um, Fairwaves has one, and Range Networks also has one. The Range Networks hasn't been released publicly, but it's production at this point. It's, it's being distributed to customers. Um, and we get a GPRS, uh, a typical good connection on GPRS would be about 40, 40 kilobits per second per direction, if it's a good connection. And high modulation for edge? Um, I don't think anybody's working on it right now. Yeah, HG is a well, pretty much a different system. Now, it's based on uh, on GPRS. It's much less different than UMTS, for example. But uh, it's still uh, a lot of very different operations than GPRS. So it's not like, a, like one week of work to implement this. It's a couple of months. So well, we have like a, a plan to do this sometime. If if somebody wants to participate, well, you're welcome to do this. It's our GPRS implementation is open source. You're welcome to come and to do your participation, to make your make your contributions. So the hardware should be able to do it. The hardware should be able to do the 60 core M or Yes, sure. Yeah. Really. Yeah. There is no problem with this. Yeah. Um, yeah, Edge was designed to be sort of drop-in compatible with, at least with the analog part of the GSM radio chain, and the additional computation isn't that much. Yeah, the most problem is that with uh, all the signaling, which is quite different. So do you have a running base station, or can I just use my one of um, So, this is a typical, you know, a typical sort of open BTS directory. You know, when you unpack the software, you have all these various directories. Um, most of these names are pretty straightforward. GSM is where most of the GSM specific stuff is. 
SIP is where most of the SIP stack is, SQLite is where most SQLite is. You have multiple transceiver directories. Um, these are different transceiver builds for different types of hardware. So OPTS is built so that the radio mode, and radio mode and hardware interface is actually separate from the GSM stack. And what this does is it makes it reasonably easy to write different types of drivers for different types of hardware. Um, and then control, most of the actual state machines and control layer stuff, most of the actual code that, that makes sense to most developers is actually in this directory. Um, you know, this, this, this directory is a lot of, a lot of math. Uh, this directory is where most of the things are happening that you actually recognize as software. Um, when you build OpenBTS, when you build OpenBTS, it's a normal, it's a, it's a very straightforward um, uh, GNU style, um, you know, auto gen configure make. It's not that exotic for OpenBTS itself. Uh, when you actually build OpenBTS, most of the binaries are put in a directory called apps. Yes. Oh, man. So. <coughs> Not the best direct, not the best type of it. Okay, so, and in the apps directory, here's what got built. The two key things that got built that you could really care about are OpenBTS and OpenBTS CLI. And when you run OpenBTS, what you're going to do is, the easiest way to do this the OpenBTS application itself doesn't have a, doesn't have a direct console. It's headed. You just started running it. It's really more like a daemon than, than an application. So what you're going to do is you're going to run in the background, and then you're on the CLI and the foreground connect to it and talk to it. So I'm going to start. Um, hang on. I'm going to do as you do. I remember this time. Do it with the Thank you. 